And now I think I'll do it. Ooh, recording in progress. You hear that, Greg? We're recording. I guess, I guess we're going to be going live. Here we go. Hello, everybody. My name is Alex Vidal, Regional Vice President for Coal Banker here in Dallas, Fort Worth. It's been a minute. This is episode 133. We are relaunching. And in the relaunch, I figured, you know what? We're going to start off with a real estate icon inside joke with Mr. Greg Rand. Um, for those of you that are watching that are within CBDFW at a minimum, Greg Rand is our new executive vice president for Coldwell Banker. It means he pretty much sees the central region of Coldwell. Greg, what, what states do you oversee? Everything in the, in the central time zone. So we've got a big real estate company in Chicago, another one in Minneapolis, another one in St. Louis, uh, and then Houston, Austin, and of course, Dallas, Fort Worth. There you go. All right. So you started what, two months ago? Just about, yeah, a little more than that. All right, cool. So who's Greg Rand? I mean, I had heard the name. I heard Rand Real Estate before and all that prior to you coming on. But, you know, take us back to the beginning. If you're going to sure. two minutes, who's Greg? Great. And by the way, the icon thing was just the, the PR department. Got to love them. They referred to that me as an icon in the industry when they wrote the press release, which I didn't stop them, but it wasn't my idea. I'm never going to let you live it down. <laughs> I know. I don't. My, <laughs> I've told my wife at least 30 times this summer, like, you know, that's the way us icons roll. Like, you know, yeah, I'll clean up my dishes, but when I get to it, you yeah. know, now, anyway, all kid to side. So I've, um, I've been in the real estate business since I was a kid. I tagged along with my mom when she was a real estate agent. I never thought real estate was a cool enough business for me. I wanted to, I'm one of those guys that I came out of college in 1990. So the earliest tech millionaires happened when I was in my twenties and I watched people get really successful, really young. And I got enamored by that. Um, and, uh, and never really thought that the, this was going to be the industry for me because my mom was a very successful real estate agent, became a broker and it was mostly gals. And they, it was kind of a, a light and a little bit of a silly industry from a distance watching, but um, but I look back now and I had early memories of one that I've told you before of of tagging along with her in the office and at age like eight and seeing a woman crying in the conference room and being like, why is that lady crying? Something's wrong. My mom said, oh, she bought a house today. I'm like, so why did she not like it? Why is she crying? And she goes, nah, no. Nah. And she explained over many examples like that, that what happens in a real estate office is pretty heavy stuff. That that I think she said that that young woman, her childhood ended today. She bought a house, she has a mortgage, she has responsibility and she's scared. That's why she's crying, but she's happy. Don't worry about her. Um, and I, I learned from working in corporate America in my 20s and doing a variety of other things in the technology space. There's something really special about this business. You know, I mean, it's just houses, but it's houses. Right. I mean, houses are where you have Thanksgiving dinner. Houses are where you lay your head to sleep or you lay your kid's head to sleep. It's where everything important in your life, for the most part, takes place. Uh, being in the business of helping people find them, um, helping people achieve owning them, um, I think is awesome. And then when you start adding to that, the fact that it's a it's a complete playground for entrepreneurs. Every real estate agent is an entrepreneur. There are so many entrepreneurs like I had the benefit of watching my mom go from being a stay-at-home mom to being a real estate agent. And then one day she pulls in with a Cadillac. I'm like, I guess things are going okay. We got a big silver Cadillac Fleetwood in the garage. Um, I watched her take over an office, become a broker owner, and then grow a business that I eventually came out of corporate America and, and took over for her. Uh, but I watched entrepreneurship start from scratch. And I watched it happen. And I was given the gift of like believing that it's totally doable. I watched success happen day, day by day, step by step. And it always gave me this impression that it's actually, I don't want to say easy, but that's the way it felt. Like it's hard. You're going to work a lot. You're going to put a lot of energy in. It's, you're going to have to be patient. It's going to take you time, but like it works. You know, you could build something valuable. You could build something, the kind of pride that she got out of her business, uh, out of building something from nothing was so enormous. My brothers and I got a chance to watch that take place. Probably the, the best gift anybody ever gave me was witnessing that entrepreneurial success. It stayed with me my whole life. Um, I started a few businesses and sold them over the years. And, and it, I always began with this idea that I know what it looks like and I know where it ends up, right? Um, and I know if you keep your eye on it you, and you're not an idiot, it, it's going to go well. You know, stuff can come out of left field and take you down for sure. And I'm not saying anybody who fails is an idiot, but you get my point is that it's, 
Um, America is an amazing place and, and real estate in America is an amazing product. So when you graduated college, where did you go to college? Siena College, upstate New York. All right. So you graduated college. Where did you go? Like, what was the progression? You said you got into like the corporate world. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was a C student, barely. And so there was no salary job waiting for me. So I went in straight commission selling mortgages. That's, you know, that was when a loan officer was kind of a not a very well-known job at the time. So I spent several years as a, as a commissioned loan officer, um, dealt with buyers and, and, and refinancers. So buyers and owners of property. Spent a lot of time. It's funny, actually, because when they hired me with my terrible college transcript, they thought, well, his mom's got a real estate company, so he's going to be sitting pretty. Yeah, your database. Want... They're, they're going to get your data, but you're going to get their, their data. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm going to get all these referrals. And then I show up in the office, and like literally two weeks ago, I had a mullet. I had a silver spider earring hanging down an inch from my ear. I had an ACDC T-shirt with no sleeves. And then all of a sudden today, I walk in with a haircut and a suit saying, hey, would you like to refer me your buyers? They didn't want anything to do with me. Her agents were like, wait, you had a spider earring? Silver spider earring. Yeah. Do you have, do you have any pictures of that? Because if you do, I, I think yeah, I, yeah, I, I think yeah. the CV Central Region would, would want to see. Let, let me ask you this, Greg. You, you've obviously been around the block a long time, not much longer than me, but you've been around a little bit, right? Extra decade, sure. Extra decade. I was, try, I was trying not to go there with you, but extra decade, right? So here we are, extra decade. You know what I love? I love I love common denominators, right? And as much as people want to think the business has changed and there's all this stuff going in this direction that we're realtors going to be out of business, it's going to be completely virtual, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of common denominators still there from when I got started in the business 24 years ago and when you got started in the business. What are what are some of the common denominators you're seeing today that existed when you first got into the business? Well, you know, there's two things that make this, this business tick. One is people, one is data, right? And so I was around before the internet and I was around when the internet was colliding with every industry in the country and real estate was a biggie because back then anybody who's been around a long time knows that real estate agents were known to not give up the information. You know, they would put a, they put a classified ad in the newspaper and not tell you the price because the, and the training manual said, don't give them the price when they ask make them give you their phone number first. So we literally would be the guardians of the, of the property information, knowing that if they have to get to that, they want that. They don't want us, they want that, but they have to come through us to get it. That was the landscape of this industry. And they used to tell themselves, we're a people business, we're a people business. And yet you looked at it and you said, but the customers, when they call you, they wanna know what's for sale, the buy side anyway. And the sell side wants to know what the houses are worth. And so you're really in the information business and Maybe you're kidding yourself a little bit to say you're a pure people business because, you know, that's not why the customers are calling you. They don't, if they want a friend, they'll get a dog. They're not calling you because they need you. They call you because they want the information. The industry started out resisting, but then literally by like 1994, 1995, the industry turned on its heel and opened up all the MLSs to the public in a way that nobody would have, would have expected, right? This is an industry that would have been defensive of itself, yep. protective of its what it was considered to be its asset, but because they really did believe that it was a people business, they gave up the information and said, fine, is that what you want? Take it, shop till you drop, call me when you need me. And 28 years later, we're still at the center of most real estate transactions. And so what it came around to is they, us information technology people, which is what I was back in the 90s, I was, I was one of the people saying that realtors are over, realtors are going the way of travel agents, nobody needs them. Sorry, mom, you guys are finished, the internet is here. And I, I kind of mocked the industry who kept saying, no, it's about the people. Then they gave up the information and the people side of things shined through. So it is because moving is a big deal. Okay. I don't care how well adjusted and confident you are when your kids used to sleep in that house for the last 12 years. And now they're going to go sleep in that house starting tomorrow, different school, kids are upset, kids are nervous. It rips your heart out. The further away you move, the more it tears you up. There's so much emotion wrapped up in this real estate transaction. I think that's the reason why over 30 years with one disruptor after another coming along in, in, in an arrogant way, and I was one of them back in the day, in an arrogant way saying this industry is not going to last, they've bounced off like a bug off a windshield one after the other, and they continue to. Um, even when they have a billion dollars of venture capital, they still can't quite get traction in the big way uh, when they're trying to disrupt this thing, because this thing, people just really seem to feel very comfortable 
going navigating this transaction with somebody at their wing who knows what they're doing and who could be a shoulder to cry on, who could be a bit of encouragement when it's necessary, or help them avoid pitfalls because you make a mistake, it could cost you in this, in this thing. And I don't think it's the dollars and cents as much as it is the life changes that happen. And when those, like, have you ever moved and that moment when you actually leave the house and everything is gone and you cry? Dude, right? so while you talk, I'm going to look up this phone. So I moved, let me see, I moved in June of 2020. It's funny, as soon as we started the interview, the, the yard guys next door started going crazy. I can't so, hear. I, so I I moved in June 2020. Okay. And, and I, just because you brought it up and, and talking about that, it was at the end and, and, you know, a little dead air here for a second, but who cares? You're going to see this photo, right? You ready? I mean, and my wife's going to kill me, but I posted it on Instagram anyway. So let me, <laughs> let, let me go to, uh, let me go to this. Well view. Enough. Yeah, look at that. Look, we're all, we're all poor. We cried our house. You, you know, our house was our, was our, our Mecca, right? Like that's where we're your family. Was. Yeah. Listen, if you, and, and I mean, it's an inanimate object, but is it really right? Yeah. It's an inanimate object, but I always felt when I was leaving, like I was leaving somebody who didn't want me to go. I said, listen, I do the same thing when I trade a car. And so I'm a psycho when it comes to this kind of stuff. Like, I'm just an emotional guy in general, but I think, I don't think people articulate the thing that is the most important about what we do. It's because they're in that state. And when you're in that state, having somebody around who's got a light personality, who knows what they're doing. It's, it's really not so much about, I'm going to help you avoid mistakes. It's like, I always tell the, the story about how I thought it was amazing that my mom's offices all had helium balloon tanks, like yeah. the coolest thing ever. We, there's so many damn balloons involved in this industry that we have our own helium tanks, right? <laughs> Why are there so many balloons? It's because it's such heavy stuff that we have to keep it light. Yeah. You know? All right, so, let, so let's, let's switch gears a little bit about the housing industry. I want to go into your role. I want to go into Cobalt Banker for a minute. So the, the roles, if we were to look at our roles within Cobalt Banker, you have branch managers. Um, next up from the branch managers, you have district managers or regional vice presidents like myself. Yep. We go to the president of a state um, like Charles, who then reports to an, e an executive vice president, which is you. How many RVPs are there, or I'm sorry, EVPs are there in Cobalt Bank? There's three. Three. West, Central, East. Got it. So it's you, Greg Macris, and Kate Ross. And Kate Ross, yeah. So what's your role? What is it? What does an EVP do? And then I, I want to piggyback as to, did you're 50, 53, right? Yeah. Two. Okay. 52. Hey, come on, man. 52. Uh, you don't look a day over 51. Um, so the what does an EVP do? And at 51, where you kind of have like, do you put in the time? You could probably do whatever the hell you want to do, right? Why come into Coldwell Banker, the, the 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 biggest real estate company in the world, you know, two months ago when you could do okay. anything? And, and there is all this change in our industry. Yeah. So what do you do? Like, what's what's the role of an EVP? And then let's go from there. Well, um, they won't tell me. Okay, Ryan Gorman, our CEO, from the very first time he interviewed me for this job, he told me, "How would you do it?" And I said, I don't know, Ryan, why don't you tell me how you'd like me to do it, <laughs> right? And he's like, I don't do it that way. This is a, it's a swing role. It's a, it's a wild card role. The presidents, as you know, have a high degree of responsibility over these metros and these states. Um, the CEO, they, you know, people have a pretty good idea what a CEO does, but the executive VP role is intended to be um, whatever the person who has the role thinks is important, right? Okay. Well, I happen to think what's important is you and Charles and the other presidents and the other district leaders and vice presidents and branch managers, and of course the the agents. But my main focus is to um, try to cultivate a an environment where talented people feel like they're part of something exciting. Um, that they have mobility upward, if that's something they're interested in, that there's accountability so that if there's something like I, I need to earn, like you and I have only known each other for two and a half months, seems like longer, yeah. right? Because we've had a lot of powerful conversations already. And at some point you'll do something wrong and I'll be in a position to say, I think you did that wrong and you're not going to be upset. You did right? it. What do you mean? You did it, you did it on Tuesday. On Tuesday you called <laughs> I, me I guess I might have, yeah. After that agent lunch, you're like, hey man, I, you know, did you say that already? I'm like, yeah, I did say that already. You're like, eh, you know, Next time, I wouldn't do it that way. And you were right, by the way. You, you're, you, that, that was right. I don't want to say- It didn't bother right. you in the least. It didn't bother you in the no. least because I put, enough, I put enough energy and time in. I mean, you're also a very easy guy. 
to uh, to have that kind of relationship with because you put so much energy in and it's 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 so such good stuff that you do because your heart's in the right place and you put your back into it to go along with it. Um, but it's you know what it really is is we've got 30 or some presidents around the country and we've got one CEO and you can't have 30 people report to one person. So they created this layer. It's an ill-defined role intentionally um, to the point of why I came back is I spent, you know, I, I was mentioning, I came out of school, I was in the mortgage business, got into the technology business, worked for this company in the nineties. I was the national technology evangelist in the mid to late nineties doing tech tour 96 and tech tour 97 half day seminars on this is the internet. This is a digital camera. This is contact management software. This is an email attachment, like pe people's minds being blown. Like I don't need a fax machine anymore. Um, but then I took over the family business. My mom wanted to semi-retire and my brother and I got in and my other brother got in and my other brother, brother got in. So all four of us were there for a small period of time and grew that brokerage. And it's a company around the size of your DFW operation that we grew. And then I left and I left because the housing crisis told me that it was time for something that I had been waiting for was finally going to happen, which is, and in, which is houses were going to be treated finally as financial instruments, investment properties and owner occupied houses were finally going to start to get their due as really powerful wealth creating assets. Everybody knows, but nobody measured. Mm -hmm. And so I started a company called own America and own America was all about enabling investors to take positions. We called it own America because that's what I think we're doing here giving people a chance to do that. Yeah. Like you get a deed, right? You own your piece uh, and you should. <clears throat> and the fact that you can is half crazy um, and it's awesome. And so I was after helping people uh, uh, learn how to do it responsibly. And, and um, there was so much nonsense about the housing meltdown being some kind of permanent state. And there was all this crap about buy and flip and buy and flip and get rich quick. And it was like, no, no, voice of reason accumulate a portfolio, accumulate your own little empire of real estate. And so we built technology and training and tools and a customer base and then ended up landing a couple of big Wall Street firms as that industry converged on the housing market, you know, eight years ago. And that thing, that business cranked and I sold it. Um, <clears throat> and so I spent 10 years working with technology on the one side and Wall Street on the other. And after I sold it, I spent a couple of years working in the firm that bought my company. And then I get a phone call from Coldwell Banker. And the funny thing is, Alex, I don't think I've ever told you this, but I had COVID back in late, this, late November, early December. I had a light case, but I did have one night where I was get, my fever was up at 102. And I'm like, that's it. Like, I'm finished. You know, like, I'm going to burn up in a ball of flame here. I laid in bed all night and I went through a slideshow slowly in my head of every part of my life, right? Second grade teacher, little league coach, first girlfriend, college, wife, career, the whole thing, just like really... It was enjoyable. It was keeping my mind off the fear that I was I was experiencing, um, and it put some things in perspective, which times like that will do, right? And I realized that the twelve years that I spent in that brokerage company were the most fun. Like they were the most fun. The ten years after in the Wall Street business was also fun, but it wasn't as much. It wasn't, and I came to the conclusion that I'm made for this business. I really enjoy it. I like. I like, I really like being around real estate agents. They're, they're a quirky bunch. They can frustrate you and make you crazy. But Amen I that. grew up being, I grew up learning how to appreciate the burden they carry. Uh, they're on straight commission, right? So the sale doesn't happen. They don't feed their kids. They deserve support. They deserve defense. They deserve people to be racking their brain to think about how they can make their lives just a little bit easier today. Give them a little bit of support. Just notice they haven't been around for a few days to give them a call and say, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. You haven't been around. I just been working from home, but thanks for caring, right? Like that stuff. Um, so like literally my fever, my fever um, passes. And like the next day I get the call from the recruiter saying there's an opportunity to call a banker. Would you be interested? And I was like, I don't know what I would have said yesterday, but like right now I am. It was this crazy serendipity wow. that I realized that as fancy as I thought tech was, and as fancy as I thought Wall Street was, this is where I wanted to be. Um, that, so you've been in the role, what, two months now, two and a half months? Two and a half, yeah. Right. So I, I wrote down two questions, uh, easy and hard, right? And, and I wrote them down literally right now as we're, as we're talking, I'm, I'm taking notes, which is kind of the, the complete opposite of how I used to do these interviews. I used to do these interviews 
questions ready to go. And I'd be oh, like, you'd actually hey, plan right. them? <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd plan them. It was stressful. Imagine that. <laughs> Man, it was so stressful. It was crazy. And you know, so Greg, uh, you graduated college in 1990. Tell us about, you know, whatever. You know, I wasn't that bad either. But, you know, I had them written down. And now as, as we talk, it's great to have a pad because I can write them down. Um, so in the, in, in the two and a half months you've been in the role, what's been the easiest part? What's been the hardest part? Easiest part was it's like riding a bike. OK, um, the kind of real estate company that my family started that I then worked in for that decade plus was all culture and heart and family oriented. And we managed to maintain that feeling, even though we got bigger. Um, and when I showed up here and I met the team, it was like going home. It was this is the same kind of real estate company that I grew up in. Right. So I kind of know what to do. Right. Like it's not like there's no there was no learning curve on how to do this. Now, the learning curve is that I've never worked at a Fortune 500 company. I never worked at a public company. <clears throat> so I have a long list of things that I don't I'm not going to say <laughs> and I'm not going to do. <laughs> Wait, hold on, hold on, time, time. You just went like this. Do you actually have a list? Sticky notes. Don't say this. Don't say that. <laughs> yeah, I got in trouble with HR like four times. Same thing. I come from like a privately owned. You know, we were we were flying by the seat of our pants kind of environment. Yeah, and it's, it's easy enough. I mean, I did radio for a number of years where you can't curse, and so I learned how to like express myself free form without dropping f bombs, and so it's not that hard. But um, I think the the hardest part, and I wouldn't say it's hard because the people here really are genuinely like nobody yells at anybody around here. Like, there's no bosses coming down on people. Like, I I just didn't really know what to expect, um, and so keep my mouth shut for a while and going to meetings and not saying anything and coming out being like, I wonder if I should have said something. Like, are they wondering if I, what's going on up here? Is there anything going on? I don't say a word. We're in a two hour executive committee meeting and I barely say a word. And that's not my instinct. You can see, you know, anybody watching this knows that I can just keep running at the mouth for as long as you need me to. Um, so the, the I, I, I guess the hardest thing, um, I just came into this knowing that I had a lot to learn about how to deal with an organization this resourceful. Like there's, there's a lot of things that I used to just go ahead and do because I was a CEO of a small business. And so I did a lot of it. I made most of the decisions. I'd pull the trigger. And, um, you know, like we are hiring an, a, a regional vice president in Houston. As soon as I got the green light, I called the recruiter and said, go find me somebody. And then a week later, I get a phone call saying, hey, Greg, just want to let you know. Like there's like a protocol that you have yeah. to follow through. You're supposed to like request this from the department that does talent acquisition. I'm like, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so it's that kind of those kind of dopey, clumsy moves inside of a company this big. The upside of that is that we've got all the money of God to work with here. I mean, we've we've earned a half a billion dollars worth of free cash flow in the last couple of years. And so we're we're uh, when I say dangerous, I mean dangerous to our competition. And we've got a senior leadership team, Ryan Schneider. I like him. I like the fact that he. Um, is aggressive. Uh, he's also a gentleman. He's nice to be in meetings with, um, but he wants to win. Um, and uh, and we now we're, we're in such a my time is impeccable because we rode through some leaner times. Now we're here and it's like we're armed to the teeth to go out and win. And we've got new business models attacking us from all sides. Very well funded venture capital funded companies attacking us from all sides. But I still think that if you're as armed as they are with capital and tools and technologies and green lights to run. And you have the heart that this company does, 100 year old company, right? You have that culture that they don't have. They haven't been around long enough that they don't value the culture. I know this about those companies that we can get what they have. We now have what they have, which is a lot of free cash flow to, to go to town. Um, but them getting what we have, like either you know this or you don't, and it doesn't happen overnight. You know, so I love our chances because of what I've said from the very beginning of this conversation, which is it's an emotionally charged product, which means the people supporting people is a crucial element of doing this well. And if all you are is a pack of mercenaries that got recruited together, but you don't care about each other and you don't even think it's important to care about each other, you're not going to be able to, to stop us. Um, and you're not, I don't think long term they're going to be able to keep up with us. And I don't think they'll be around in 100 years, but I think we will be. So let's talk. Okay, so two perfect segue. I think we've been going like twenty minutes now. We're we're a little over. So let's let's. I got two questions I want to wrap up with. One is, I, I have this this thing in my head about one year, three year, five years, right? Um, I actually learned in my prior career or my prior job that happiness could actually act as an anchor, 
um, because I was ecstatic where I was with my prior broker. I loved it, right? Free reign, call the shots, all that good stuff. You saw the reaction when we moved. We loved where we lived. But in terms of where I wanted to be in my life professionally in a year, in three years, in five years, it didn't play a role. And even though I was ecstatic, if I wanted to make a move to play to where I wanted to be, I had to leave somewhere where I was ecstatic. So ever, se ever since that day, I've been thinking always, constantly, one, three, five, one, three, five, one, three, five. So now that you're in this role, what does Cobo Banker look like to you? Let's take, let's not look nationally. Let's look at the central region that Texas falls under, mm -hmm. right? What is, what is the central region under Greg look like in a year, in three years, five years? Um, well, we're a $700 million a year revenue business. Today we'll be a billion in three years. Um, we'll be, you know, eight and a quarter next year and we'll make our way to a billion, which is just an exciting goal to be, that's not the prices of the houses added together, which a lot of people in real estate yeah. like to try to do. That's actual revenue dollars. No, we've done almost $3 billion in, in DFW. So yeah, we're talking about- Yeah, this is actual commission dollars. That's a, a billion dollar P&L. Um, it's, it's already such a strong organization that it's like, it's, a, it's such a firm foundation that building on it, that there's a lot of people out there that don't belong here. And there's a lot of people that do, right? So getting really good at- and you know, I'm obsessed with this right now, getting really good at packaging, bottling, capturing, bottling, amplifying that cultural thing. You know, like the side of your brain that controls language is different than the side of your brain that controls emotion, right? Or it feels things, right? That's a Simon Sinek thing. And I've checked it out and it seems to be true, but you feel it's true. Like, why do you like watching a sunset? It happens every day. It's no big deal. But yet, how do you explain how that feels? How do you explain, like explain love to me? I look, I did this once, I think you were on the meeting where I looked up love in the dictionary. It's like, doesn't even come close, right? So culture, character, um, because of the nature of this products are so important in this business and we've got that foundation, we're going to figure out how we're going to amplify it and package it, package it, amplify it. And it's going to attract all the right people that want to be part of that kind of an organization. And when you add thousands of more people carrying our brand out there doing it the right way. Um, I think what happens is Cobalt Banker, again, it's been around for more than hundred years. It's been a really a great real estate company the whole time, but um, we have a shot at being the dominant real estate company, uh, the dominant real estate brand in the country where we've danced around with that, but there's been other ones at the same time. I think we have a chance to run away with it because down deep who we are, um, and just to, to the point you made about happiness being an anchor, it's absolutely true that if you live the right way, every time you turn the page to a new chapter, it hurts. A new, a new chapter, it hurts, right? Like it was good and now I'm doing this and I want it to be even better. But man, is it, it just tears me up to have to leave there. I moved down from New York to North Carolina eight years ago. It's a pretty big deal. Disrupted my whole family. We moved down here to live in a a place that was Southern instead of Northern, essentially, you know, yeah. laid back and, and a little bit slower. I'm a country boy, it turns out. I didn't know that. Um, but I believe that, yeah, pursuit of happiness, a lot of people will stay put because they found it. But if you've got ambitions to taste more in life and do other things, I live on a lake. I couldn't have done that up there. 11 million bucks would have cost me to live on the water up in New York. I got it done here a whole heck of a lot less, right? So if you want to have a life full of exciting experiences, you're going to turn the page and that chapter is going to close and it's going to, it's going to tear you up inside, but it's still for me and for guys like you, it's the right thing to do. That's right. You know, my, my, I have a mentor, his name's Emmett Logan, and I'll share the story with Emmett Logan about Emmett long later. Emmett's 83 years old or 82 was in the gangs in New Jersey as a kid growing up. Uh, his parents thought he was going to get killed. They, they essentially told him you have to go to college, dropped out after day one. Okay, and he was afraid of heights, so he enrolled as a paramilitary trooper in the army to get over his fear of heights. That Came do back, it. was homeless and an alcoholic, was washing dishes during the day, loading boxes for UPS at night. Got so good at speaking with the drivers of the trucks on how the boxes should be loaded that he got promoted. And he pretty much ended up running all of UPS for Germany. Came back, helped run UPS nationally. This wow. is a mentor of my life, right? He, awesome. he uh, sits on the board for J.B. Hunt even now. And one thing he told me, and he may have gotten it from the book. I don't know. He'll, he'll watch this, by the way. I know he'll watch it. Cool. Because uh, if I don't ask him, okay. his name's Emmett. 
Um, and if I don't ask you the next question, he'll call me out on it. But he, he once said culture eats strategy for breakfast. Oh, okay. And uh, it, it's good stuff. So let me ask you the, let me ask you the last question. Um, I, I think everybody has an effort to try to improve themselves, right? And there's th pretty much three big ways that you can improve yourself relatively easily or for free right now. And that's either reading a great book or watching a great TED Talk like the Simon Sinek TED Talk, um, which Emmett showed me the why one, by the way, the one that you referred. That's good. Um, or it could be a great podcast. So what, any recommendations for the audience? Yeah, you know what? Um, the first thing that popped in my head was Shoe Dog, the Phil Knight book, the, uh, the story of Nike. Okay. And I think the reason why, first of all, it was written like he, if he wrote that, he, he's an amazing writer. It, it felt like a novel. Uh, the fact that it was a true story was incredible. It was also read incredibly well. So it was riveting. Um, I think I ran more miles in that week and a half than I ever have in my life. I just wanted to get back to the book, you know? Yeah. Um, but it was another one of those things. I really like hearing the businesses that started out with nothing and made their way. Like I was saying, my favorite thing is that I watched my mom start as a real estate agent and then climb and climb and climb and climb. And, and it just made it all feel so doable. That book, especially because I grew up and Nike showed up on the scene when I was a kid and like you see where it went from there. Um, it was an amazing story. And the big takeaway for me without being a spoiler is how long they were on a shoestring. Like that company was on a shoestring for decades. No pun, like literally, no, no pun intended. Boat, what's that? Yeah, yeah, no, no, pun, no pun intended. If one boat sunk over the, over the Pacific bringing shoes from China, they were out of business. They were selling the shoes, paying the bank, making the next batch, getting it shipped over, selling them, paying the bank, borrowing the money, making the next batch. They spent literally decades. Um, so yeah, Shoe Dog, I recommend it highly. There you go. Greg, man, we, you know, to me, if nobody watched this, and I hope a ton of people watch this, this was a great side to, uh, to see of you that I hadn't had the opportunity to explore yet, just because we've been both running like uh, chickens with their head cut off. But uh, thank you, my friend. I'm going to pause the recording. Uh, let me see how we do this here. Any parting words for the audience? Uh, no, just, I just want to thank you. This is, I, I love that you do this. And it's always nice to, it's always nice and it's flattering to be asked to questions like this. You got it, man. All right, let me hit pause. See you guys later.